Next is the applications of simulation. In 1958, Dr. Emil Grabe wrote a paper in which he's described the applications of simulations. And he gave some really excellent applications. The first one is as an aid to thought. If you have a really big system that you're trying to understand, you usually cannot cram all of the information about it into your own head and see how all those pieces of data are related to each other and keep all of that running in your own head long enough to understand how the whole system works. So you create a simulation to help you to extend your mind, to make your memory banks larger, to make your reasoning capabilities bigger. So the simulation can help you think through that and you can rely on it to store some of the information. You can rely on it to remember how to do a square root and you don't have to keep remembering to do that a hundred times yourself. That's how it's an aid to thought. You can come to understand bigger systems through the use of a simulation than you can just by sitting down in a room by yourself. The second one is as an aid to communications. Uh, assume that you've taught yourself this everything there is to know about a system, uh, how a bunch of helicopters operate together. And you want to communicate that to somebody, well, they may not be able to follow your logic and your explanations. They may need that very same simulation to display to them the lessons it displayed to you. And then their lights will go on. And so you can use that simulation as a tool to communicate your ideas to other people so that they will say, I understand. Whereas otherwise you have somebody trying to explain it to them and they say, I just don't understand. You're just too smart for me. I can't understand how you would ever figure this out. And you know what? You probably didn't. You probably had a lot of tools helping you. A lot more tools than just talking. Well, this gives the same tools to the act of communication. Then there's as a form of training. And most of the students that we find sitting in these classes are involved in simulation for the purposes of training. So we talk a lot about simulation for training. But you can turn a simulation on and you can teach people to do their job without them having to be in the real situation. They actually teach people to operate forklifts in factories using simulations. And one of the reasons they do that is because the forklift drivers have this huge machine and they stick those forks through the walls sometimes. Or they accidentally bump into other people, pieces of equipment. And they want them to learn, don't do that before they give them a real one. Well, imagine how much more important that is if you put an aircraft carrier at their disposal. And you say, why don't you pull this aircraft carrier into dock? Oh my gosh, you'd probably pull it up on a sandbar in a, in a heartbeat. Same thing with an aircraft. Fly an aircraft. Why don't you land this thing? Let me let you land it in a training simulator a few hundred times first, and then we'll let you land it for real. <clears throat> Simulation for prediction. We know a lot about the, the world around us. We know very little about the future. But the future is usually some situation we know something about right now extrapolated through relationships and conditions into the future. And you can use a simulation to capture what you know about right now and guess about where things are going to go in the future. You can guess about how a nuclear weapon is going to explode without actually exploding one. You can guess what it's going to be like when a MiG-29 slams into the ground and explodes without actually having to do it. So that's one of the reasons you use simulation is to predict things without having to ca cause all the chaos of actually doing it. Or sometimes you need the information before that future gets here. Then as an aid to an experimentation. If you have a bunch of ideas in your head, you can go into a laboratory and experiment with those ideas. Well, sometimes those ideas don't fit well into a chemistry lab or a physics lab. You need a laboratory like a war in Afghanistan to try those ideas out. And since you can't conveniently host such a war, it may be very convenient for you to host that war in simulation and then experiment with your ideas to find out if there really is a relationship between A and B by executing those two events and seeing how they're related by not executing one and see it how it affects the other. You can try out all your ideas in the simulation and learn some lessons without actually having to host an event which you have no power or no funds to host in real life. And finally, as a form of entertainment, Dr. Emil Grabe did not include this one. Uh, in 1958, it barely existed. Uh, 1999, it's everywhere. 
Simulations are in all the computer games that you play. Almost all the computer. If you play Tetris, I really won't claim that simulation is there. But if you do any flight simulator, any war games, if you play Quake, if you play uh, Command and Conquer, if you play, if you go down to the arcade and play Area 51 even, there are simulation components in each one of those games. Now DOD owns a lot of simulations. And as the owner of more simulations than anybody else in the world, they have done a lot more work in describing what a simulation is and explaining it to themselves so that their people can communicate with each other. And one of the things that they did was set aside some specific categories because people who were involved in one form of simulation were having trouble communicating with people in another form of simulation. For example, for a long time, I worked only in the constructive simulation field, and I was building war games. And the, the problems I tried to solve in building war games were very different than what people building flight simulators were trying to solve. And I had some friends out at the flight simulator lab at General Dynamics, and they were studying very detailed information about the flight of F-16s. And I couldn't understand why my data wasn't good enough out there, and they couldn't understand how the data I was operating with was valuable at all. The same kind of communication mismatch was happening all over DOD. So in 1992, they came out with some very distinct definitions or very distinct categories. And one of those is constructive simulation. That's where you model a battlefield and you stand above what you're modeling and look down into it and decide how other assets are going to behave. Then there's virtual simulation where you get inside of a flight simulator and you look all around and there's the virtual world all around you. And when a missile flies in that virtual world, it may be trying to hit you, or they want you to think that it's going to hit you. Then there's live simulation. Live simulation is when you go out and you actually practice uh, an activity in real world. You go out and you go through the paces with a real piece of equipment. You go through the maneuvers of an aircraft because you're really in one. But you're probably not going to fire a real missile you're probably going to simulate that in some way, some kind of laser beam or something, which I'll describe in a little bit. Analytic simulation. If you're sitting in a laboratory trying to understand how the population of the United States is reacting to uh, the presidential election campaigns, you go out and sample a bunch of information and you put it into a simulation and try to extrapolate how your sample represents the entire population of the United States. And you do an analytic simulation to help you understand what the people in the United States are thinking at this point in time. Then an engineering simulation. In some cases, very similar to the analytic simulation, but you gather all the information you might need about the flight surfaces of an aircraft. And then you simulate the flow of energy or wind over that aircraft wing and you understand how the wind parts as it meets certain parts of the airplane, where your lift come from, where you're causing drag and didn't intend to. You study very detailed information about the real world system. Uh, a good example of engineering simulation is the nuclear weapons community, where they make very detailed models of how an explosion happens and the effects that it causes around them. And finally, as a form of testing, we build simulation devices which you strap on to a real aircraft, for example. And once it's strapped onto that real aircraft, it pretends to be a real missile or a real sensor pod, even though it's not going to fall off of the airplane and shoot out and try and shoot out another plane. But it will tell the airplane it has done just that. And so the airplane can fly around and pull the fire button on their, on their joystick, and a missile doesn't leave the plane, but the simulation device tells the airplane it has departed and you get a, a data feedback from your simulation device that looks exactly like what you would get from a real missile. We do that kind of thing all the time. We take missiles into anechoic chambers and do that kind of stuff all the time. A Little bit more information on virtual, constructive, and live. Virtual is primarily a sensory experience. Virtual simulation is meant to make you sweat. They mean to wrap it around you and get you to believe that you are where the virtual world says you are. And in this example, this comes from 1952. Mort Heilig sat in a movie theater and watched a movie called Cinerama. In Cinerama, they had taken a movie camera and strapped it onto the front car on a roller coaster and taken the, the camera for a ride. 
Then they put this uh, movie in the movie theater and had people sit there and watch it. And they got the sense of vertigo. They got the idea that the cameraman or the director is trying to put this whole audience in this theater on the roller coaster. He was trying to take a movie and turn it into a virtual simulator. Trying to get you to say, I'm really on this roller coaster. Trying to get people to get vertigo. Trying to get people to feel the drops, even though they weren't dropping. And to get people to get a little queasy in their stomach if that bothered them. That's what virtual simulation primarily is. A sensory stimuli. Constructive simulation is more of a mental stimuli. You try to get the people to think about the situation, though they personally are usually not at risk. They personally are usually not inside the virtual world. They usually stand above it and think about it and tell other things in the virtual world what to do. But in a constructive simulation, you're trying to stimulate them mentally to think about what's in front of them, to think about how they would use these virtual objects, their assets in this virtual world, and try to get them to act like a chess player, learn lessons mentally. They don't have to sweat. They can sit in their shirt sleeves. They don't have to get a sunburn. They are thinking about the virtual world rather than being involved in it. And then live simulation is a very physical experience. In a live simulation, you want them to sweat just like they do in the virtual simulator, but you want more than that. You want the dirt to get in their eyes. You want them to get a sunburn. You want it to be too hot. You want them to feel what it's like to not get breakfast the morning before departing for a battle. You want the, all of those small characteristics that are all around you when you're experiencing your mission, the battle, whatever it is. You want all of those to interact with the person and for them to say, this isn't as easy in the real world as it was in the virtual simulator. In the real world, I didn't get breakfast. In the virtual simulator, I always stopped at Denny's on my way to the simulator. But in the real world, they just didn't bring me any food. And I'm getting a sunburn and I don't like it. All of those things come into play in, in live simulation. Now, at the end of each lecture, we're going to talk about the future of simulation. And there'll be a slide similar to this in which I try to describe what's happening right now and it's probably out there and you just haven't seen it yet. I'm going to tell you what's in development in the labs, things that, are, that people are thinking of. And I expect when I get to those kinds of sections, some of you will raise your hands and say, oh, we're doing this at our lab that you don't know about. And finally, I'm going to tell you about some of the wild ideas that I know people are dreaming of, and it's going to take at least 10 years before it actually exists. Here's your simulation bookcase. Most of these books are on the table over here, and I'm going to be showing them to you at the end of each lecture. If you need to know more about a specific topic that I'm talking about, these are a great list of books for you to own. They're all accessible, they're all available, and I've given you enough information on the screen and in the notebook where you can actually find where to buy it yourself. Most of them are available at Amazon.com, not all of them. Some of them you have to go directly to the publisher. You'll be seeing more of these as we finish each lecture and I tell you which book applies to which section. All right, that's the end of the introduction.